You want to go back to cybernetics? Yes, this afternoon is cybernetics. How is second order cybernetics now being used or useful? How could it be useful? That's an almost impossible question to answer. Second order cybernetics becomes useful when you begin to wonder about how the activity of knowing is possible. When you begin to be surprised by yourself that you have learned certain things, you can handle certain things. How does that take place? I think that's when, after a while, you come to a position like second order cybernetics. You ask yourself, well, there's an observer who observes his own experience and learns from observing his own experience. How is that possible? Well, if you ask me, I think you come to that by means of construction. You construct a way that seems to you a possible way towards that end. Give me an example for me, in my life. Well, how if you ask yourself, how is it possible that I can, um, that I can walk, for instance? How can I learn to walk? Well, I learned to walk by trying various means. And some fail, and others sort of succeed a little bit. And then the ones that succeed a little bit, I am able to improve bit by bit. Well, that's a construction. It, is, it all happens inside you. It happens inside you because you look for ways and means that are viable. Viable means that they are that they can be applied in certain circumstances and lead to where you want them to lead. They're satisfactory. That's really the whole thing. Well, that's the basis of constructivism. She sees cybernetics as the bigger picture. And there's certain well, parts of constructivism that lend themselves toward cybernetics. Probably. I, I, I'm inclined to agree with that. Well, you like my definition that cybernetics is the art of creating and maintaining equilibrium in a world of constraints and possibilities. The, how do you create anything in the world of constraints and possibilities? By trying. Either you bump into a wall and it doesn't work, or you get through. I have to tell you the story of how your definition affected my life. <laughs> okay? That's dangerous. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think you'll appreciate the story. It was snowing, icy, freezing snow, ice. And we live on a hill. And so one day we left to go down the hill to go to the store. And just as I was going down the hill, a big, big truck comes up, turns towards coming up the hill. I, I go to stop the car, and you know what happens. I start sliding right towards the huge brown truck. And automatically, I just go like this. And the next thing you know, I'm hitting the curb. And then I bounce off the curb, but miss the truck. And I start going back towards the truck. So I go like this. Do a 360 turn, but never hit the truck. <laughs> and it was what? constraints. You were lucky. <laughs> I was lucky. And I think that the philosophy of constraints and possibilities was very 
I'll use the word influential. Yes. In that moment. Yes. Well, that's so very I thought nice. you might enjoy that. That's very now, nice. Now I I have added and I don't know, I'd like to hear what you think about this, that the definition is that uh, cybernetics is the art and science of maintaining equilibrium in a world of constraints and possibilities. Well, I know you want to put science in it. I don't. Why not? Well, because science is essentially built on causal relationships. And causal relationships are not important in cybernetics. And Gregory Bateson yes. made that clear. Yeah, he suggested it. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess he didn't make it clear. Well, he suggested it because I think I'm one of the very few people who got it out of his writings. Yes. And not I, many. And lots of people have read Bateson, yeah. but they didn't get that out of it. And reading your take on that, I heard it uh, for the first time in a very positive way of of this idea that there are not causes but constraints. Well, it's one way of looking at the world, you see. Yeah, yeah, one way. You mustn't ever think that it's the only way of looking at the world. Never. Well, you see, I've used uh, a metaphor that I still think is a good metaphor of, for cybernetics. And that is how a river makes its bed. How does a river make its bed? There's, not, there's no causal relation involved in that whatsoever. It's that the water increases because of rain or whatever, and it looks for a way out and eventually it hits all sorts of obstacles and eventually it finds a place where it can go out. The river knows nothing about the structure or the contents of the environment, but it knows where it can go. It learns where it can go. And where it can go is constrained by the fact that water can't rise above itself. Water always has its own level. So it can only go where there's an opening. So it's constrained by the obstacles of the landscape and by its own incapacity of jumping over rocks, you know? That's... Uh, so it's an internal as well as a relational dynamic or relationship. Yes. Are we finished for the night? One more. One more. Could you speak briefly about undecidable questions? Undecidable questions were one of the areas that Heinz von Ferster spoke about and used a lot. And uh, I have very little to say about that. Because I think, from my point of view, most of the things that Heinz called undecid- undecidable questions belong to the range that I call mysticism. It's the mystical. Mystical and metaphysical. Well, metaphysics is a part of mysticism Thank you. to me. And I, in that area, I agree with Wittgenstein, who said that whereof you cannot speak, thereof you have to be silent. So I think to speak of undecidable questions is already going too far because the questions can really not be formulated rationally. Can you give me an example? Well, take ethics. The ancient Greeks knew that perfectly well. Plato said some very interesting things about ethics. He says you have to have it in your gut. You can't, you can't be told about ethics. So the question whether something is good or bad is, is an unanswerable question. You have to know whether it's good or bad. You can't reason about it. You can reason about whether it's useful, but that's not ethics. If you reason about ethics, does it become morals? 
Well, in most people's view, it becomes morals, yes, and they make rules. And they say, you must do this, and you must do that, and whatsoever, and that's all. It's misguided, I think. Well, schools are teaching business ethics. Well, my ideas about that are, if you like, very much out of this world. <laughs> because I, I don't believe that people need education in ethics. They need it only once they've been put through another education that is wholly uh, utilitarian. Then if, if you're brought up to think utilitarianism, well then you need some, uh, some, uh, uh, some remedy for that. Because that is totally opposed to any ethical thinking. I've often said, I have nothing to say about ethics. All I can say about ethics, and I have written that several times, is that radical constructivism, with its notion of viability, has one thing, namely, that viability is increased when you find that the others you construct have the same or to some extent similar or compatible notions of viability that gives your viability a further sort of value. It makes it surer if you like. So you need other people to have that reassurance of your viability. And there is no other philosophy that tells you why you should have other people. So constructivism gives you a basis from which you may begin to think about ethics, but not in a rational, constructivist way. I think second-order cybernetics gives me a space for speaking about ethics. Well, because you're concerned with the observer, and the observer is the constructor, and therefore you have to think what is good for him to do and what not. But uh, don't try to get at it rationally, because you can't. Rationally, you can only say, well, it would be good if you did that, because then we can do this and this. But that's not ethics. Rationality has to do with logic? Oh, uh, yes. And what else? Logic is part of and causality. Causality is one result of rationality. In the sense that if something has happened often enough, you think it's going to happen again. That's, it's very rational. But it is not, uh, it's not certain. Could you define rationality? Rationality has a lot to do with semantics because it's very difficult to be rational without language. But it has to do with semantics and maintaining semantic connections stable. That is a large part of rationality. That's not mine, other people have said that before, so. All right, you, you pack up and I start cooking. And I go on the deck and watch birds. Uh, you what? I go outside and watch birds. You watch birds? Do you want binoculars? I brought my own. You brought your own. If you want to think about it, Yes, I can think. I can, I can think about it. We'll do it tomorrow. Yeah.